rights dialogue with the United States, which is extremely useful for us, uh, where we can share ideas, etc. And, and also, of course, in our daily work, the EU is, is a crucial context for, for uh, moving issues forward. And I'm happy to say that our uh, current Foreign Minister, Holger Kroh Nielsen, who assumed office in December, has confirmed that uh, very clearly, I think, uh, in his public statements, that human rights and active involvement and cooperation with the UN uh, will be a high uh, priority during his tenure. Um, now, turning to my, my second part, my more analytical part, uh, and trying to address the question, how effective is current international human rights protection? Um, the first issue, of course, uh, definition, what do we understand by international? What do we understand by human rights? What do we understand by protection system? Um, and uh, I guess by international, we, we don't mean national, we don't mean regional, but, but the UN or more global. What do we mean by human rights? Huge discussion, I won't go into it, but uh, the concept obviously has many uh, uh, facets and dimensions and, and even names. I mean, in, in the European Union, we talk about fundamental rights. In, in the United States, we talk about civil rights, uh, at, at least in the national context. Uh, some emphasize freedom rights, other emphasize uh, social rights, and so on. Um, we think they are uh, indivisible. I'll come back to that, uh, which is not the same as they are all of equal importance. Um, but uh, I think, I think uh, a benchmark, a yardstick, is, is, should be the uh, Universal Declaration from 1948, which encompasses uh, basically all the rights uh, uh, table, even property rights, the right uh, of property, which is not enshrined in any of the uh, uh, international conventions at present. Um, protection system, do we only mean judicial or semi-judicial system? I guess not. Uh, at least my focus will turn to Geneva and, and also the ICC to some extent and, and view that as a multilateral uh, discussion. A second issue is, of course, what, what, how do we measure it? Uh, against what, what is the time frame, what is the reference point, the geographical scope, and how do we differentiate, it's extremely difficult, causation from correlation, and, and what is the gold standard, so to speak, when we say effective? Is, it, is the gold standard a national legal system, uh, or is it a system with as much respect for state sovereignty as possible to avoid uh, international armed conflict? And what is even possible at the uh, international level when we start to assess the effectiveness of what can be done at the, the international level. I think we all recognize that change uh, starts at home and, and can only be delivered at home uh, and cannot be uh, enforced uh, on uh, other uh, nations. Um, um, but hopefully the international system can encourage and empower people to, to bring about change at home. Um, you may think that I'm trying to avoid the question. Uh, and maybe I am, but I think it's an important message in itself to, to acknowledge how difficult the task is. It's not an exact science, and, and perhaps lawyers like myself are not the best suited to make that assessment. So I'll defer to, to others in the audience. It's a bit like the distinction between criminology and criminal law. Uh, it's, it's, it's a different discipline, at least. Um, anyway. Let me, let me try to focus, being the token optimist here, on, on some of the achievements since the inception of the international human rights system, that is after World War II, but also since the Vienna Declaration uh, and Action Program of 1993, which I think is a cornerstone uh, in, in the uh, international uh, work on human rights. Uh, and of course, there are a lot of uh, sad things going on uh, in recent years. I've studied also the Freedom House recent uh, assessment, and I will certainly not argue that all as well, but um, I will say that there are some major achievements we, sh we should not lose sight of. Uh, the um, end of the repressive authoritarian regimes, uh, communist regimes in the Eastern Bloc, the end of apartheid, I think human rights played an important role in both uh, parts, even down to one instrument in, in the case of the uh, Eastern Bloc, that is the Helsinki Accord of 1975. And in the apartheid situation, uh, the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of uh, Racial Discrimination, I think, was an important cornerstone 
even if it might not have been the decisive issue. I also think that the 1993 uh, Vienna Declaration is, is, is uh, uh, important to mention here, and it focuses especially on implementation, which is a key uh, issue. I, I, I completely agree we can't measure the success or effectiveness by looking at the number of instruments, the number of resolutions or conventions. Um, and, and that's what we're trying to do. When we look at, at assessments around the world, uh, Freedom House has measured that in 1972, only 44 countries, or 29% of all countries at the time, were free and democratic. In 2012, 90 countries belong to this category, equivalent to 46% of all countries. Slide back in recent years, I, I think is, it's too early to say that there's a long-term tendency. I think it's also relevant to look at the UNDP Human Development Index, uh, which also gives uh, uh, hope uh, when it comes to protection and enjoyment of rights, uh, education and health, for instance. Today, 19% of, of, of the world's population lives on less than uh, 1.25 US dollars a day. In 1982, that figure was 52%. And Bill Gates, probably not uh, 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 sort of a, uh, the main example of an optimist, is, is, is says that in 2035, there will be no poor countries left. Um, of course, we thought, at least some of us, that economic growth would, would lead to freedom and democracy and plurality in itself. I think probably not the case, but maybe you can prove it, that it works the other way around, that, that freedom rights are, are not only uh, an inherent uh, value in themselves, but, but also in the self-interest for the promotion of, of prosperity and, and, and wealth. Uh, another great example of the achievement of the international human rights system is, is I think, um, uh, the issue of capital punishment, the death penalty. Uh, it's, it's a sign that, that human rights standards are not static, they evolve, uh, and it's a hope, I, I think, for women rights and, and reproductive rights that I spoke about earlier, or uh, LGBT rights, that, that with sufficient attention at the international level, things can develop. Uh, when we see a number, number of abolitionist states in 1977, I understand, was, was uh, 16, only 16, and in 2012, that number was 97, while only 57 countries maintained the capital punishment in active use. I think there, there's an uh, important uh, achievement there, and I think Europe played an important part in that uh, development worldwide. Um, moving to the institutional issues, first let me just say that the ICC and the Rome Statute is, is a resounding success for many reasons, and I, I could go into a long debate about that, I don't have the time for that, but I say the main point about it is that it drives change at home by emphasizing the complementarity principle, that only when states are not willing or able to prosecute uh, war criminals or other uh, major cr criminals of international scale uh, will, will the court come into effect. And I think that is a, a main, that shows how international institutions can drive change even if it's certainly a very challenged institution at present. Turning towards Geneva, uh, we're not naive about it. We, we see setbacks, uh, we see uh, challenges. There will always be flaws in any international system comprising so many states. But I don't think there's an alternative to meet in, in say, groups of like-minded instead and have a United Nations of democracies only. We, we have to engage in a conversation with, with, the, with all the world states, and which is why we, we sometimes have to accept that even perpetrators of grave human rights uh, violations and abuses uh, become part of that uh, discussion, even if I think the Council of the Human Rights Council is trying to uh, put standards, or set up standards for, for membership, which perhaps is, is a way at least to weed out some of the worst offenders, but let's face it, it's, it's, it's a political reality we have to work within. Um, and I also agree with, with some of the observations by, by co-speakers that there are some challenges in the way that the human rights concept can be diluted and abused um, by, by certain uh, groups or, or nations, and, and we have to be there to, to try to uh, curb that uh, tendency. 
Um, I think one of the main achievements of the new Human Rights Council, which is not so new anymore, is the United uh, Universal Periodic Review, the UPR. It's something we have fought for. Uh, we wanted a stronger mechanism, more binding, but on reflection, at least, I personally think that maybe it was uh, actually to the benefit of the system that it didn't end up with binding recommendations, but rather recommendations where each state had to say whether we accepted the recommendation or not, because that, that uh, drives a debate at home and, and internationally because you have to be honest about whether you accept that recommendation or not. Uh, and I think that is an important part of the dialogue. It's, it's not a naming and shaming exercise and, and that as such it may be disappointing to some activists but I do think it, it does make a change also because it's universally, uh, almost universally uh, accepted. Now, in conclusion, Chairman, uh, I know uh, my time is running out. Um, I, it's told that Zhou Enlai, the former Premier of China, once said that when he was asked by Nixon in, in I think, the early 70s what he thought about the French Revolution in 1789, and he answered, it's too early to tell. Um, I wouldn't advocate quite such a degree of, of caution in, in assessing the uh, human rights system, but at least I think it's too early to diagnose uh, the system with a deadly disease based on the setbacks and challenges in recent years. So I would sum up my message in three points. First, it's difficult to accurately measure the effectiveness, but we have witnessed some major and lasting achievements uh, which the human rights uh, international community can take credit for, not just states and institutions, but also NGOs and civil society. And human rights is an indispensable part now of international relations. That was not a given uh, 50 or even 30 years ago. And it takes time and changes come from within. Second, national legal systems uh, should probably not serve as the paradigm for an effective international system of protection, but institutions can make a change and incentivize change at the national level. And some human rights institutions have been um, uh, quite successful uh, in that mission. I think if you compare Human Rights Council and Commission to the United Nations Security Council, you might even argue that the human rights bodies have been more successful than the Security Council has been in maintaining peace and security around the world. Um, the reform agenda should certainly be pushed, but uh, there are no viable uh, fundamental alternative, and, and the uh, UPR holds promise as we see it, and, and we should work with it. Third, the critique movement that Jakob and, and others represent here today is a proof of the success, in my, in my opinion. Um, we're working towards a less solemn, uh, less religious concept of human rights, and that not, that's not necessarily bad. Um, it would be worse, I think, if the closed circuit of, of Geneva was left alone, and it, it helps us as practitioners in the political work to hear your analysis, to hear your ideas on how to improve. And, and so I hope for good ideas here today, but I would also um, say that it's important to avoid focusing on false enemies. I don't think economic and social rights are the enemy. Uh, it may not be the focus of the Freedom House or the Freedom Rights Project, but, but I would hope that you could take pride in your focus on freedom rights and help us move the world and uh, prove to the world that freedom of expression and association are not only important in their own right, but also in the self-interest of any community for the attainment of long-term stability and prosperity. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ambassador, and um, for your optimistic comments and um, for uh, reminding us of some important facts about some successes that have occurred in human rights in the past decades. We have a few minutes uh, for uh, any questions that any of you would like to put to uh, Ambassador um, uh, before we move on to the next uh, speaker. Does anybody have a... Uh, uh, a question or a short comment? Um, I think that some members of the panel have, uh, have one. Uh, uh, Mr. Mishangano, would you care to? No, don't make a speech, just a question. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, I'm uh, fortunate enough to live in a country where I, I can I can criticize my government without fearing for the repercussions. So uh, I'm I'm uh, I'm going to do that. Uh, <laughs> or at least 
ask some questions. But you, you mentioned the EPR, and um, uh, in the fall, I, 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 I made this report where we were relatively critical of Denmark's engagement during the EPR, say, staying silent on, on, on countries like Cuba and North Korea, and, and relatively timid criticism of, of, of Russia and, uh, and, and Saudi Arabia, and, and that if you compare Denmark to the, some of the other Scandinavian countries, to Canada, to the Netherlands, uh, the, the, the number uh, of uh, interventions, recommendations uh, that Denmark makes uh, is, is relatively low. So, so how does that uh, conform with your um, vision of the UPR as an, as an important instrument? Shouldn't we be more active uh, from, from a Danish perspective? Thank you. I, I think we, we are active, and it goes back to the question of how do you uh, most effectively pursue your agenda at I, I think we, we have to prioritize. You have 50 seconds, sometimes even less, to make a recommendation to an indivi individual country. It's extremely difficult to get everything in there. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily a, a, a sign of strength to speak uh, on, on every country. Uh, we are at least trying to uh, uh, choose countries from a variety of regions and with a variety of problems to, to address those. Um, and, and I think the fact that we do come with recommendations uh, forces the, uh, question, the countries in question to, to consider the issues and, and reply to the issues, and that's what counts in the end. Um, we, we also share responsibility or the burden with, with our EU partners, so it's, it's in, in no way, uh, I think, uh, a, way, uh, uh, a sign of... Um, uh, um, lack of interest uh, in, in, in North Korea or Cuba that we, we do not uh, have individual recommendations for those countries.